Okay, well, we'll slowly get started. I can see that uh, a couple more people have joined in the in the last minute or two, but um, we want to make sure we've got some time for discussion in this session. So welcome, everybody, to the Partnering with Publishers session. I am Ian Prinaskevich, but just call me Ian. Uh, so I work at PLOS, uh, where I develop a program of activities to increase adoption of open research practices. And we have a mixed panel today of uh, scholarly publishers and providers of tools for scholarly communication or, or open research. Why did we put this panel together? Uh, well, partnering is definitely important and it's obvious that no single organization can build all of the infrastructure needed for open scholarship and no single organization can reach all of the potential users of, of scholarly infrastructure. Um, and as long as scholarly publishing in journals and books remains a critical part of the researcher workflow, publisher policies and services that the publishers connect with or provide can be important incentives for the promotion um, or the accessibility of open or innovative approaches to scholarly communication. And um, publishers can also be an important connection to new audiences for providers of, of new scholarly tools. Um, so for some of those reasons and others, publishers are interested in partnering with, with innovative tools. Um, also because uh, tools can often meet the needs of researchers in a particular community or a particular discipline in a more, in a more focused way. Um, personally, I'm also interested in this issue, having been on both sides of the fence, working in, in publishers and tool providers, um, and also exploring partnerships um, to advance open research. And it's not always easy. Um, it's sometimes quite hard uh, organizing partnerships uh, between publishers and tool providers. Um, infrastructural developments um, in publishing can, certainly from the outside, sometimes appear a bit slow. Perhaps they can seem costly or complex. Um, and, and for tool providers, there can be perhaps frustration about ostensibly a lack of interest in their solution and about how that might help align uh, with, with publishers and, and, and their goals. So we thought what better way to explore those, those challenges um, with a, a panel of tool providers and publishers getting together to, to talk about those things. So we hope that you're gonna leave this session with more understanding about what these challenges are from both sides, uh, but also and more importantly, what makes a successful partnership work. Um, so hopefully at the very least that will they'll equip everybody uh, to have more productive conversations about um, partnering to advance open research. Um, also pleased to see that Ian, um, our final speaker, has uh, gotten into the room. <laughs> Hi Ian. Um, we just got it started. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce um, a galaxy of stars from the publishing and tour provider worlds, both in their current and, provider, uh, pre current and previous roles. Um, so what we're going to do, uh, there's going to be a short introductory statement from each of our five speakers, um, and then we will crack on with some discussion um, and um, we'll, we'll monitor questions as well and, and see where that leads us. Um, so I am pleased to introduce uh, Daniela Lowenberg, Product Manager at Dryad, which is an open source curated repository for research data. Um, also Emma Ganley, Director of Strategic Partnerships at Protocols.io, which is an open access platform for sharing research methods and protocols. Jessica Polka, uh, Executive Director at ASAP Bio, representing Review Commons, which is a service that offers peer review of preprints. And representing the publishers, we have Andrew Smeal, Chief Strategy Officer at Hindawi, uh, an open access journal publisher. And finally, Ian Mulvaney, Chief Technical Officer at BMJ Group, which publishes journals, clinical decision support and medical education things. Um, so speakers, if you want to share anything on your screen, just hit share. It should just work. Uh, I know some have slides, some don't. But without further ado, Daniela, you're up um, for your opening statement. Great, thanks, Ian. Um, so Ian mentioned that I'm at Dryad, which is an open source data repository. Um, and so Dryad's worked with publishers since its inception in 2009, helping with the implementation of journal data policies and JDAP. Um, and so through the years, we've kind of evolved in working with publishers and other research stakeholders. And so one thing to acknowledge is that partnering with publishers is really essential for us as a data repository, because we have the same user base and we need to have cohesive seamless messaging and tools as we're working with the exact same people. 
Um, so before going into some of the specifics I wanted to run through, um, I think it's worth noting what partnering with publishers means to us at Dryad. And for us, it can mean everything from memberships and non-technical partnerships like aiding in and serving on policy committees, but also technical integrations and day-to-day -day support with manuscript and data linking. And so we have plenty of examples of how this has worked really well in the past and it's been mutually beneficial, um, like our involvement with the British Ecological Society and Royal Society. Um, we have an upcoming launch of an integration with an e-journal press with the eLife and AGU journals. And it's been so great to see how we can put out our needs, build something and then launch it really seamlessly. Um, but we also have some examples of times where things have not been smooth sailing. And so instead of naming those, I wanted to go over three high level things of why I found it can be really difficult um, in working with publishers and how we can maybe overcome that. The first is what I'm calling financializing a partnership decision, um, which means turning non-financial decisions into a business decision or thinking as a partnership only in financials with money signs. There's a lot of low hanging fruit, like just working with repositories and promoting them uh, that we really like to do and promote or things like um, building non-financial integrations that use open source software. Um, and so we've seen where that can be really harmful where if a journal does not want to um, partner or talk about a repository, but the funders and institutions and researchers submitting to that journal already have, there seems to be a weird dynamic there. The second is technical barriers. And a lot of that I think is because the publishing landscape relies on a couple of major publishing platforms like manuscript submission systems. And when those are not open source, which the majority are not, it's a lot of churn and not so seamless for us to actually build. So we're building the exact same thing with every major publishing platform, but we're not allowed to share any of that information or gather people together to talk about it. So we have to repeat it each time, even though we're building the exact same thing. Um, also relying on the publishing platform timeline can be um, really difficult. And so again, low hanging fruit, thinking about partnerships, not just as technical, what are the first things that we can do, like promote cross messaging. And then the third and probably the most important is that we found a lot that publishers are looking for a one size fits all solution. And in the data world, that will never happen. Um, Dryad serves specific communities, but there's thousands of other repositories that do. And many of those we don't want to infringe on, we work together with. And so we need to really change that message that there's ever going to be one data repository that is the cure-all. So um, I'm hoping that in this panel, we can talk more about how we can better leverage each other's shared motives and goals and dance more elegantly in coordination, use each other's strengths and trust in education, um, and actually have it be more than just technical and financial partnerships, but more like knowledge sharing and cross promotion. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, we'll move on to the next opening statement with Emma. That is great, thank you. I do have just a, um, a handful of slides, but I promise I won't be too long. And it's I'm as much paranoia about my internet as anything else. Um, so. Thank you. This looks like it's going to be a really interesting panel. Um, very happy to be here. I'm going to talk a little bit about modular publishing and partnerships. So as Ian mentioned, um, I'm, I'm now at protocols.io, but um, I also have about 15 years of publishing experience in editorial work at Adplos. So most recently, Plos um, Biology, where I was chief editor. So I've thought a lot about this from both sides of um, the, the coin at this point in time. Um, First, I just think it's worth maybe stepping back slightly and thinking about the research process. These days, it's really a very modular thing, and um, both in how it's performed and in what's generated along the way. And we do a really good job of capturing some of these modules, and we have really well established mechanisms to capture the outputs and what people are doing along the way. But they're not always put together in the best <laughs> in the best way possible. Also, we've spent a lot of time trying to shoehorn as much as possible into that research article in the middle of this. And it's not actually generally uh, the best solution for some of these other research outputs that we're, that we're generating and producing. So publishers have sometimes successfully and sometimes maybe not so successfully tried to absorb 
the need to better provide a way to include these other core research outputs generated. And sometimes they've tried to build solutions themselves and that's not always been successful either. Um, and what seems to be emerging more and more as a good way forward is to come up with partnerships that put together the people who handle the data like dry I'd say or code and the different teams of people actually bringing content together in, a, in an interlinked way. Um, so from a protocols perspective, which is who I'm representing today, protocols I we have a really simple mission actually, which is to make it easy for researchers to share method details before, during and after publication. And so I've written FAIR protocols here. So we are not open source <laughs> and we are not a not-for-profit. So we're a for-profit closed um, source platform. However, we are open access. Everything that's published is published CC BY. We have over 9,000 public protocols. So we're a very open repository and it's free to publish. So anyone can come in and place content and publish their content on protocols.io. We have a public open API and a lot of really well-written developer documentation. So pretty much open to integrations with all partners uh, of all shapes and sizes and flavors, as long as they're willing to kind of put in the work to work with us and our API that we already have. And then the content itself is dealt with very much like a traditional publisher. We make sure that everything is archived and mirrored. It's not gonna go away if something happens to the platform. Uh, and you can also export all of the content in various different formats. So we do our best really um, to, to provide access and ongoing um, interaction in any way that a, a partner would want to. Um, so I think we, we maybe will get around to discussing a bit that, you know, the variances of open source versus non-open source. And if you're would you like the interesting question that came up yesterday is who defines what open is. And I think that's really, really an interesting point for a lot of discussion. I'm sure we could all talk about that for a long time. But I think in this context, that's actually really a pertinent point. Um, and last slide. So we do already have a lot of successful partnerships with publishers. Um, publishers, individual journals and societies and also funders and more and more also with institutions. Broadly though, these are not technical integrations. They're often much more related to policy implementations on the partner side, whereby they are either encouraging or requiring the use of protocols.io for method sharing by the authors or researchers, the people receiving the funding. Um, and so from our side, we are thrilled to integrate and partner with all of these communities and, and different partners um, and the different kinds of partners as well. And in fact, the way that that's generally non-technical makes it much more of a just conversation and a policy and documentation issue than anything else. Because the users can obtain a DOI, there's a really easy way to link between using persistent identifiers from these platforms. So that's kind of the interoperable in FAIR, I think with the DOIs and the open API, we really kind of tick that box. Um, and it's really nice, actually, we are gonna have a more formal relationship coming forward that will be more integrated with PLOS, which was very recently announced. Um, a new um, article type in PLOS One will be lab protocols and they will be research articles where the protocol will sit the protocol as part of the research article will sit in protocols.io. And so I think it's great to see that we're able, we're, we're moving forward these partnership conversations and thinking about how we can actually put the modular pieces of the research process together in a more sensible way that should make life easier for the researchers too. So that was all I was gonna say for now, I will hand over. Thanks, Emma. Um... So up next, we have Jessica. Um, we can't hear you if you're talking, Jessica. Sorry. OK, hopefully you can now. Um, uh, thank you so much. And um, ASAP Bio is a small nonprofit working to promote innovation and transparency through the use of preprints and open peer review. And it was at a 2018 meeting uh, that was focused on promoting the publication of peer review reports that we uh, made a proposal which we called peer feedback. So this was, you know, you know, basically three years ago at this time, pretty much just a twinkle in our eyes. But the concept that we wanted to implement um, was a variation on the theme of journal 
independent or journal agnostic peer review, which of course is not something that is uh, a new invention. Um, but the model that we were presenting at that time was to create, to focus really on preprints and create an evaluated preprint um, that would you know, perhaps stand alone as a uh, demonstration of productivity um, and that journals might invite to submit. So through the process of refining this concept, um, we heard from authors and uh, other uh, you know, potential stakeholders strong concerns about duplicating the journal peer review process. Would peer feedback become a, another step, another hurdle for authors? And we heard, um, especially in um, you know, private or anonymous consultations with authors, that uh, the major concern was, you know, will this help me get published in a journal that is going to help our career? Um, so I think that you know, this consideration of uh, creating strong linkages to journals, um, coupled with some other feedback that we heard about um, you know, concerns about the ideas of reviewers getting paid, um, made us revise this proposal. And we presented it to a variety of society publishers um, with the strongest support and interest coming from EMBO. Um, you know, and as we move forward through the planning phases of this project, um, we realized how valuable those publisher experiences and connections are um, in building a reviewer base, an editorial base, um, and in the recognition that would help assure authors that uh, this kind of innovative and strange process will lead to something that will ultimately be beneficial for them on an individual level as well as for science as a whole. So just as a brief overview of how it works now, uh, professional editors at EMBO conduct a peer review process of submitted manuscripts. When the reviews come in, authors can submit their referee preprint to BioArchive electively, and they can also transfer it within the review common system um, to one of 17 partner journals who have all agreed uh, not to repeat peer review. Um, you know, I think that, uh, so just to highlight that there's multiple goals of this project. Um, of accelerating dissemination and eliminating re-review cycles and improving transparency. Um, and I think that, um, you know, certainly one of the things we can talk about is that, you know, I think different goals appeal to different partners. Um, and so that's something that I think we've really tried to, um, you know, integrate and come together on a process that works for everyone through this. You know, just really briefly to say, I think that authors who are, you know, obviously opting into the platform are very uh, positive about the experience overall. I won't you know, go into all of this, but just to say that in general, um, you will find this process is reasonable um, and that the, the proposed revisions are fair. Um, and the, as far as uh, the, how the process is working, it is really fast and efficient. Um, however, um, a relatively small fraction of authors are actually opting in to posting their referee preprint which is something that um, I can discuss how we've kind of come around that. Um, but you know, for the purpose of this panel, I think this is uh, an example of um, finding ways to align goals and needs in order to come out with a service that um, can tangibly improve the publishing experience for authors and get more research out there earlier. So thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, so we'll move on to Andrew uh, from Hindawi to, to give us uh, to give us his uh, his and the publisher perspective. Hi, everyone. Um, so about Hindawi. So in case you aren't familiar with us, we're, we're an open access publisher. Uh, so we publish 205 of our own journals as well as 34 journals for societies or other um, publishers. We also uh, develop and maintain an open source publishing platform called FINA. And so, so for us, when I talk about partners, it kind of has two definitions. It's the societies and institutions that we serve as a publisher, as well as the tool providers we work with in our software. So I hope it doesn't get too mixed up and confusing, but I'm going to be talking about both interchangeably. Um, so so FINA, our platform, is, is an end-to-end -end platform for running OA journals. Uh, so it has everything from submission, editorial, production, payments, and uh, hosting. And we use it both for our own journals and for the publishing partners that we work with. 
Um, we also integrate, uh, Phenom integrates with a, with a number of open science tools like persistent identifiers or uh, preprint servers, authorship tools, data repositories, uh, payment services. Um, so, so why did we build another platform? Um, we had been operating our own software platform for, for many years. Uh, so we were happy with the flexibility that came from controlling that. Um, we were also comfortable with the idea of, of building our own platform. Um, and we wanted to be able to focus on OA. So, so selecting workflows to optimize for, selecting which projects to work with like protocols or Dryad, um, specifically with, with an OA focus in mind. Um, and we looked at, at commercial options. We, we considered all the big platforms and, and we decided that there was a gap in the market for an open source platform designed to support larger open access publishers specifically. Uh, and we found that the cost of, of building and maintaining the platform wasn't significantly different than the cost of using one of the commercial options at the end of the day. Um, so it's important to make the distinction that, that we, um, we sell publishing services, not the software itself. Uh, and selling software is, is a whole different proposition. Um, there's a big difference between building something for yourself and letting other people use it and trying to uh, uh, commercialize a software platform. Um, you know, with a commercial platform, you have to select a niche of customers and please everyone in that niche. And, and you can adjust the size of that niche, but there's trade-offs between the commercial opportunity and, and the size of the niche that you work with. And you have to keep all your, your chosen customers happy, which means, you know, scheduling releases very, very carefully, documenting very thoroughly, keeping older versions of the software alive, providing support, training, uh, sales. And, and this requires a company to be set up to do that. So there's a difference between a software company and a publishing company fundamentally. Um, so building a platform for, for oneself doesn't totally remove these obstacles, but it, but it simplifies a lot of them. Um, so we focus on optimizing the editorial and production workflows that we use for our own journals. Um, and we try to convince partners, publishing partners who are going to work with us to use our workflows and teams, not our software. Um, so that means, you know, convincing them that, that we found a good way of doing things, not convincing them that, you know, this platform is, is what they need to be using. Um, so when we develop integrations in the platform, we're trying to think about integrations that would serve everyone. So, uh, you know, really a, a standardization. So if we implement this, it's because it'll benefit Hindawi and our partners, and we won't have to make custom one-off choices uh, for each workflow. Um, and, you know, our, uh, with our infrastructure, we're thinking about cost, uh, we're thinking about turnaround times and efficiency, as well as the quality of the output and open science goals. So we're we're considering, you know, uh, a business angle as well as a, an open science angle. Um, and we generally don't go ahead with publishing partnerships if they're going to force us down a road of extensive customization because we just don't think we could support those successfully with with the way that we're set up. Um, so quickly, why did we make Phenom open, you know, I think it's it's useful to point out that um, uh, Phenom could be open or closed. It would serve Hindawi either way. Um, switching to open source doesn't say anything fundamentally about the quality of the software. You can have good open source software or bad open source software. Um, either way, you know, the software can can do what it's designed to do or or not. Um, but with open source software, bad code that we write is subject to external scrutiny. So we do get you know, feedback from observers, and that imposes discipline, which is useful. Um, it also makes it easy for multiple groups with shared goals to collaborate, and we, we did that very successfully early on with the with the Coco Foundation. Um, it uh, helps developers who are considering whether to work with us to to be able to see the project that we're working on, to understand the quality of the code, uh, and also helps them later share their work publicly and get credit for their work, um, which encourages good people to work with us. Um, it also means that partners who might potentially want to work with us can look at our code, uh, can decide whether this is something that they want to use. So for publishing partners, whether the features that they want are there, and for technology partners, you know, potentially the cost of integrating uh, with, with the platform. Um, and open source occasionally simplifies hurdles around working with uh, institutions that have open source mandates or working in certain jurisdictions that have um, restrictions on where you can host uh, code and data. Um, so really by, by making, and you know, most importantly, I would say by making our infrastructure open, uh, it can't be acquired. So we've created something that's, that's independent. Of course, it still costs money to maintain. It still requires ongoing investment, 
but it's something where if, if uh, Hindawi ever ceased to exist or if a partner who was working with Hindawi ever decided to go their own way, the, the code is there to be taken and forked and reused by anyone that, that chooses to do so. Um, so, so that's a, a quick summary. And then I, I look forward to questions about um, how, uh, how we work with different, uh, different providers. And I see a, a question from Daniela in the chat and whether Hindawi platform has an API. And the answer is no, it doesn't have an API, although that's not because we don't wanna have an API. It's actually something that, that we'll be rolling out in the future. We just haven't built it yet. It's still quite a young platform. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, we'll move on to Ian for our last uh, statement and should leave us uh, a few minutes for discussion. Ian? Thank you, Ian. Um, so I think I, I, I would just like to talk about why it's hard to integrate with publishers or work with publishers and just some things for you all to think about as you go down that journey. First up, publishing houses, there's a lot of stuff going on in them. There are a lot of different people with different roles. People are busy. They tend to run with not very much slack happening in the organization. So any piece of work that someone has to take on to work with you on an integration involves some other piece of work either not happening or getting, getting um, postponed. Um, and so finding who has the authority to make the decision can be really complex. And, and that's not gonna be the same in any organization. Sometimes it's gonna be driven by the editorial wing. Sometimes it's gonna be driven by the commercial director. Sometimes it might be driven by um, an editor in chief or it might come from production. So you can end up in a conversation with someone but they may not have the final authority to sign off on a, on a decision. And then when they do, they may be removed from the place in the organization where implementation happens. So do they have actually the ability to put items on the, on the software development roadmap or on the platform roadmap, even if they have an agreement in principle with you to work together. So finding out that capacity is, is interesting. Um, Publisher workflows are Byzantine, complex, and have a lot of human powered integrations. So while initially it might look like there's a good fit, it could end up that there's some complexity in that workflow that just causes delayed integrations, which was not apparent at the beginning. And mapping that out can be helpful. Um, I think a good way to approach it is to think about how you lower the barrier to adoption. So are you talking about where this shared value being created are you reducing the cost of adoption and the cost of trialing? And you're probably also working in an environment where you may be competing with other vendors. Um, so understanding how they are pitching their services and how you can talk about the contrast that your service has can be very helpful. I'll give an example of twice where I've been involved in organizations that did not work with Phenom. And I'll explain some of the reasons why we didn't. So when I was at Sage, uh, we investigated the open source platform for a new product idea that we had. And after going through it, we realized that in order to work with it in the Sage context, we would have to build up uh, areas of expertise around React uh, and Node.js, which didn't exist in the organization at all. So although the code was free and working with Hindawi could have helped support us on that, um, we didn't have the intrinsic skill base within, a, within Sage as an organization to adopt that platform. So I was chosen not to work with them. I think there was a moment where BMJ investigated the platform as well, um, but that happened at a moment when the development resource for front-end engineering was radically scaled back to the point where there was only one engineer working on the front end. And so that was a reason why BMJ at that time didn't have the capacity to work with that, those set of tools. So those are two very distinct and different reasons why just contingent things that have happened or choices that happened in the past made it not possible to, to work with a really nice open source platform that could have solved some business problems for those organizations. So I'm going to leave it at that and move over to discussion. Thanks, Ian. I'm, I'm first going to uh, ask if any of the speakers want to respond to any of the points that have been raised by anyone. No? Okay. Um, so one point that, that I've heard come up, um, Andrew, you were talking about um, not wanting to support custom solutions and Daniela, you were talking about um, almost the, the, the opposite, the, the opposite of that problem in, the, in, in that some 
or I interpret as sort of thinking about specific specific workflows or specific solutions for particular for particular journals. Um, does anyone have any suggestions on how one might square that circle, or how to approach that that a, a partnership where there might be a conflict between a desire to build a one size fits all and the need to support um, um, quite a specific use case, let's say, in for one research community. Sure, I can I can say something quickly about that first, and then I'm curious to see what Daniela thinks. Um, you know, what one I, I mean, I think it's important when from from the perspective of designing the product that you uh, think about the problem abstractly. And so, uh, what we want to avoid is building uh, custom one-off hard-coded solutions for the same problem over and over again. But that doesn't mean that we don't want to support uh, multiple ways of solving the same problem. It just means that when we do that, we implement the, the solution in an abstract way so that it's as easy as possible to offer multiple solutions. So an example of, it's not a particularly interesting example, but an example of how we do that is Phenom integrates with um, multiple different message queues. And the way we do that is we can have the message queue be abstracted a layer away from the uh, component that's using the message queue. And so it says, the component itself in, in the code just says, call message queue, send message. And uh, at a different part of the software, we say we, we have a, a, a feature or a, a parameter that says which message queue to use. And then it's easy to just write, you know, one for Kafka and one for Rab RabbitMQ or whatever message queues we want to use. So thinking of basically talking to multiple customers, understanding the concept in an abstract way so that you can write the minimum no uh, amount of repeated code. That, that's generally the approach we try to take. I agree with Andrew. I mean, the that's what I guess I'm referring to is things just make it easy. Make it, as Daniela points out in the chat, use standards, use open standards, make it really pluggable and easy. Like Dryad works with hundreds of journals, soon to be thousands of journals. And that is because we have an open source set of APIs and anyone can plug in, plug out, right? So the on the public from the repository side, that's easy for us. When I was saying it's difficult is if people don't want to share that information to develop open standards and want to have their own custom way of doing it because it's proprietary, that's what makes it difficult as an open source provider. Thanks. Um, I've noticed some discussion in the chat. Um, I won't put anyone on the spot, but 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 Dangela Sader, if you did want to expand on, on your comments, feel free to. Oh, okay. hi. Um, I do have a baby that might be starting to, to bubble in the middle. Uh, but yeah, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I, I think it's really hard. Uh, the, the main, um, to me, like one of the main challenges when I, when I think about this, this concept um, are like just when we develop standards, like who is developing those standards and who are we listening to uh, in terms of like uh, trying not to avoid uh, standards that once again like fa favor like the biggest fish in the pool um and i don't know what the solution is but uh i think core is on the right track and and jessica knows more about uh, new development when it comes to i'm all concerned with pre review uh, about like preference metadata and review systems so that's the niche that i'm in okay thank you uh, does anyone wish to respond on that or jessica to to elaborate yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that, you know, this is something that I've also been um, thinking about a lot in the context of review commons. Um, review commons, I think there's a desire and ambition to use Mecca in transferring manuscripts around, but I know that a lot of the solutions for moving um, the papers in this initial phase are kind of customized um, uh, solutions that had to be built, you know, one off. Um, I'm encouraged by the idea of um, standards that enable broader interoperability um, and, you know, the idea of, uh, you know, as Danielle mentions, um, CORE is working on a distributed model for sending and receiving review requests and communicating about reviews between repositories and preprint services. Um, and you know, that is something that Review Commons is uh, involved in as well. Thanks. Um, I'm going to change the topic slightly. And um, Emma, I want to pick up on something you mentioned around partnerships operating in different ways and not necessarily being technical. Um, could you could you provide 
uh, any advice or observations about 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 that approach? Um, I mean, I think in theory they can be much easier to move forward, right? So, like Ian said, there's all kinds of different people who might be the decision maker, the ultimate decision maker or backstop at the publisher. But if it's more of a policy decision that really is about recommending or encouraging or or mandating, which you know there'll be different there'll be different approaches to this kind of partnership. If you're encouraging a specific behavior via a policy, that is much easier to have a publisher update their policy pages and implement at individual journal level or across all of their journals in theory. I mean, it still has a lot of complexity to it to actually get everybody on the same page for those kinds of standards or the requirement and enforcing. But um, it's not, really a financial decision and it can I mean there may be financial ramifications towards enforcing something but broadly it's not got an implementation cost other than you know updating pages and making sure people know what they need to do to to enforce that policy and so that can be an easier way of partnering in a lot of instances and certainly for us I mean it's just been the logical thing right we have the persistent identifier so as long as people know how to get their authors to put the links in the right places and materials and methods it's a pretty trivial change to just either suggest or enforce and from the funder perspective you know they're sometimes they're making their grantees use protocols.io but again you just provide the training and then it goes forward that way so it's i think can be a lot easier for for um from the platform perspective I think it's a it's a it's a very important point that you're making because you know it's it's not always that we have a, a blocker in terms of someone approving a feature or even the cost or technical difficulty of implementing a feature. Sometimes we're just stuck with difficult priority decisions and we have to do something before something else and we don't have unlimited bandwidth. And so finding ways like with protocols.io just to be able to say to our authors, uh, let's make sure that an email goes out to everyone explaining how to use this, you know, where to put the DOI. That still lets us move forward with the partnership without, um, you know, needing to, um, you know, even something small like developing a button to go somewhere can take can take a you know a week of developer time or something like that. And so, it really helps to think of these non-technical integrations. Right. I mean, and Ian, you'll know as well from working with between PLOS and protocols that I owe Ian H, not Ian M, that we are starting with a light touch kind of EM uh, to include editorial manager to include the DOI because development in editorial manager is anything but trivial to actually do, but you can move forward these partnerships without having full blown integration, which, you know, hopefully maybe someday in the future you get it better integrated technically too, but in the short term, there are no blockers to actually moving forward. Um I'll, I'll take a crack at answering Daniela's question on open source. Great, I was going to ask you to anyway. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. So uh, you've got to make a distinction, I think, between a service you're offering, which has open source that's powering it behind, in which case, just don't talk to the publisher whatsoever about whatever it is that's powering the service. Just have an agreement on, on a service of agreement, and then you're offering your services, and then try and make those services create value or make value for the authors or whatever. I'll tell you a story about a project we worked on in an unnamed publisher, which I worked for, uh, where my team used a very well-known piece of open source software called Elasticsearch to create a really, really tiny, teeny, tiny, teeny, weeny, itsy bitsy, tiny database with like 300 items in it or something like this, uh, just to serve some metadata. And then we had to hand it over to our IT department and they wanted a support contract with Elastic because they were afraid that if this thing broke, they wouldn't know what to do. And Elastic came back and said, well, our minimum support contract's like 60 grand, but you don't need, you really don't, you should need this. You don't really need this. By which time we'd already got people in the company using this teeny, tiny, teeny, tiny database to serve some needs. And then the, the our tech team just had to sort of go, oh shit, okay, okay, I suppose we'll support it. But there was that kind of like, lack of understanding of what open source was and the right way to approach it that, we, that even internally we had to like shim them from around the edge to try and get them to use it so it's complicated so i'd say yeah just hide those details from your partners and work more on the value add and on the service level kind of thing thank nice. you all the publishers in here just like don't listen <laughs> <laughs> on the other side like I think from Dryad's perspective, we are an open source tool, but we've been working with 
um, commercial publishers since the inception. And I'm not sure open source ever was a driver for some of them. Um, we know that now it is as maybe the landscape shifts, but early on, I'm not sure that was why it was chosen. And so the model has just been an open membership model that is accessible and open source hasn't played a huge role in that. I was thinking really quickly just to note that it can be funny the kind of open source purism because we have had some publishers who have not wanted to go further with integrating with protocol Sire because we're not open source we're open in pretty much every other way that you could possibly imagine and kind of fair and so you know we tick all the other boxes but that is enough of a blocker so I feel like there's a conversation to be had that we probably don't have time for here today but it's I mean it's just a you know something that impacts the decisions about these partnerships. A quick thing that might impact the way we look at a partnership is, is also it, it always helps to have researchers involved in the conversation, I guess, to hear the perspective of, of why this benefits editors or authors or reviewers. Um, because oftentimes the conversation is just between the, the platform and the and the um, developer and um, you know, it gets stuck unless we hear, oh, no, this really benefits this block of users this way. And look, they're already using the, the tool for this. Thank you, everybody. I uh, suspect we might even get automatically cut off on the hour. So I don't really have time to offer you a final statement. Um, there will be a recording made available. I think there's a lot of interesting case studies and, and advice and experience there that folks can reflect on. Um, and, and make yourselves a little better equipped for, for conversations about partnerships. So with the seconds left, I'll just say thanks so much to the panel for joining this at particularly short notice. I know we pulled this together, but um, I think you did a great job and thank you for the audience interaction and um, see everyone on the internet for the rest of the conference.